Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Getting Real with Harm Reduction. It's another live discussion on Facebook and YouTube with the Knight Ministry. My name is Burke Patton. I'm the communications manager here at the Knight Ministry. Joining me today for our discussion about harm reduction are the Knight Ministry's Noam Green and the Knight Ministry's Andrew Wyda. Um, they are both members of the street medicine team. Um, I am here at the Knight Ministry's headquarters, uh, so I'm wearing a mask, but Andrew and Noam are joining us uh, from their homes, so that's why uh, you see them without masks. Um, if you're not familiar with the Knight Ministry, this is um, a little bit about us. We are a, a, a nonprofit that provides housing, healthcare, and human connection to members of our community struggling with homelessness or poverty. So before we get in and really start talking about um, harm reduction, I wanted to give Noam and Andrew a chance to introduce themselves. So Noam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here at the Night Ministry? Hi everyone. So I'm Noam, I'm the lead street medicine outreach worker here um, on our street medicine team. And basically what I do is uh, coordinate and organize our street medicine team, put the schedule together, all that kind of administrative stuff. And then I also um, just help facilitate the whole team to do what they do best, which is care for our clients. So a lot of what we do is provide free medical and social services. So that can include housing assessment, help with getting your stimulus check, help with getting your ID, um, linkages to care, referrals, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as far as harm reduction aspect of that. And I'm here in my house uh, where I live with my wife and our two rabbits. <laughs> and yeah, that's me. And so street medicine, uh, just to give folks a, a little bit of an idea, you're, you're out there literally going to people who are, who are living on the, on the streets and encampments and yeah. Um, so street medicine is different than how you might practice in a clinic or at a hospital. Uh, we have a customized van. So it's a, it's like a big transit 350 van that's been customized for street medicine use. So we have a, a section in the middle that we use for clinical visits or we used to before COVID. Um, and then we're able to do some kind of basic primary care actually in the van. And we also distribute basic survival supplies from the van. So we're able to get into a lot of the smaller encampments or even just to where, you know, one or two individuals are sleeping unsheltered. So it gives us a lot of, uh, a lot more range and a lot more flexibility with our outreach. Great. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at the Night Ministry? Yeah, sure. So I am a licensed clinical social worker and a CADC certified alcohol and other drug counselor. Uh, I work as substance use advocate. Uh, primarily, I focus on, uh, I work with the street team to focus on uh, people struggling with opiate addiction, um, all sorts of addiction, but opiate addiction is the heavy hitter um, and the one that we typically offer more medical services for. Um, uh, like I said, my, my main focus is, is working with them, trying to get them through uh, detox programs, inpatient programs, outpatient programs, uh, medical assisted treatment. Um, and when we're not doing that, it's it's basically uh, outreach, just trying to get people food, water, clothing, all the all the fun stuff we offer every day off the van. Thank you so much for those introductions and and the background information about street medicine. I want to invite everybody who's watching this evening, um, if you have questions for Noam and Andrew about harm reduction, please put them in the comments and we'll get to them soon. But first we have some questions uh, to get the conversation started. So the first question I wanted to ask, which is a basic question, but uh, there's probably a lot in the answer, but what is harm reduction? So I get, for anyone who isn't versed in this work already, uh, we work from a harm reduction perspective. Um, so harm reduction is based in person-centered therapeutic models on motivational interviewing practices as a counseling strategy. Um, as a medical intervention, harm reduction has proven to reduce disease, death, 
uh, additional consumption of limited resources offered through the medical system, for example, wound care, comfort medications, uh, other mitigating resources. Um, it addresses and accounts for matters that don't fall under normative conditions or circumstances. So we at the Night Ministry primarily work with Chicago's rough sleepers, including those who struggle with substance use, uh, in addition to other challenges that may exclude them from the status quo. Um, these things often relegate them to fringe societies, like a lot of the folks you'll see sleeping in tents, uh, ultimately causing really great difficulties when attempting to utilize any benefits for which the system in place exists to address. So these people uh, they fall through all the cracks, like every single crack that exists. Um, and, you know, if you don't understand, I mean, I, it's hard for me to understand my own health insurance and I have quote unquote good health insurance. Um, so imagine how many barriers would exist if you don't even have identification. I mean, it's, it is very difficult to get yourself any help if, uh, if you don't have the things required of you. So it sounds like uh, uh, a lot of it is really to help people kind of get through those or get them out of those cracks, so to speak, um, if that's the right term. Um, and are there particular behaviors that that were that you help people target with harm reduction? Yeah, um, I mean, through our efforts with Alderman and the mayor's office, and we're, I mean, we we work like I, we just mentioned with the van. Uh, we have the outreach bus. Uh, we'll be working with on the L trains for the next two years at least. Um, so we literally meet people where they are at. This is not just a metaphoric term for how we can help clients improve their own circumstances and learn to make healthier choices for themselves, but actually means to seek people out who are suffering and bring choices to them that otherwise would not be available. So as I mentioned, I, I focus on uh, opiate addiction. That's just that's just one portion of this population. I mean, we all work to focus on people with opiate addiction. Uh, we uh, There are other people on the team who do a lot of work to get people housing. As we, as, as people at the Night Ministry see housing first, you know, that is really the number one thing that gets people through uh, any of this. It, it, it's very difficult to get sober, but imagine doing that in a tent. I mean, like, it just insurmountably adds to how many barriers and or how many how many problems you have to deal with and how much more painful that is. Um, but I mean, the population is is all over the place as far as what their difficulties are. Noam, I wonder if I could bring you in on the discussion at this point. And are there other um, behaviors or things that um, clients that you work with um, that you engage with them around with harm reduction? Yeah, I mean, um, Andrew, I think, explained it perfectly. Like with a lot of our um, injection drug users, we provide clean needles and syringes and then um, alcohol wipes, um, free Narcan, which reverses uh, overdoses to prevent death. And, you know, we've heard, um, I guess you could say like secondhand that a lot of our clients are able to use the Narcan to prevent, you know, the deaths of their friends and people they know on the street. So that's been very effective. Um, and then as far as the clean syringes and, you know, hygienic supplies, that really helps to reduce um, skin and soft tissue infections. And those infections can, if they're not addressed, they can develop into something really serious. And um, if you're living outside or sleeping outside, you know, you don't, you're not able to really keep those wounds clean. So it can, it can get worse pretty quickly. So we use uh, clean syringes for that reason. And then we also provide free condoms, uh, free lube, stuff like that, just, you know, in case someone would need to engage in sex work or, you know, that's their profession. We want to make that a little bit safer for them. And, 
Yeah, like Andrew said, um, housing first. Housing is a big part of harm reduction because if you're housed, you can you have that stability and you can work on whatever else you need to work on. Um, so those are the big ways that we help out. And we also have like a, a limited supply of other um, other hygienic supplies that people would use to use drugs. So something like a glass pipe or a straw, you wouldn't necessarily think of that as harm reduction, but um, it will it can potentially reduce like Hep C infections because if you're if you're sharing a pipe and you have a cut on your lip and then you give the pipe to someone else, so. Uh, we try to encompass the whole broad range of behaviors um, without judgment. Yeah. And I can, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what we know about the effectiveness of harm reduction, because I think that's such an important factor of it that we wouldn't be doing this um, if we didn't, if this was not evidence-based. Yeah. I mean, Andrew, do you want to speak to that a little bit? On it, on it, the effectiveness of it being, I'm sorry, my voice. Yeah, so the, the question would be, um, what do we know about the effectiveness of harm reduction? Um, you know, that it is based on evidence. What does that tell us about, you know, why we use this as a strategy? As, as Noam pointed out, um, avoiding uh, wound, uh, using wound care on the street to avoid soft, and t soft t tissue damage and just the, uh, those uh, those things can get pretty gnarly uh, if you don't have access to a shower and, and to be able to to clean yourself uh, to clean wounds well. Um, these things will clog up the ER more than anything, and this is the, these these folks aren't normally uh, insured as well. So when people who have no money, no resources, and need need care badly. Um, it's not easy to just, I mean, maybe some cases it's easy, but it's, it's typically not easy to turn these folks away uh, from that care. So this is what, this is what really does not help the system run at all um, because we all have to kind of rely on these things. Um, and that is proven. That is, that is data, that is hard data that we can look at over the years and see how many resources have to go resources have to go to people who don't otherwise have any care. Um, obviously, you know, clean needles do even more of that in avoiding uh, infections. Narcan reverses death, literally. And um, I know I've, I've been doing Narcan training and harm reduction training for a little while. And um, I've had it's gotten better over the years, but there, there are, there were, in the beginning, there were people who really didn't understand it. Uh, it sounded simply like we were saying using heroin is okay. It, like, it sounded like we were enabling the behavior. Um, and it was a really interesting problem for me to confront because at first I was just shaking my head like, how, how could that be the next thought? But if you've never seen these things before, it could be pretty jarring, I imagine. Um, for us, the simple answer is you don't get to learn any lessons if you're dead. You know? So this gives you a second chance. Um, and I don't think you even need a lot of data to just see the simple fact is if you have a second chance to live, then you have a second chance to live well. Um, I mean, that is, that is an extreme version of that because we get to see it immediately happen. Uh, this reverses an overdose immediately within seconds, I should say. Um, longer term, it's harder to tell when you're seeing people suffering with, you know, pretty bad wounds, uh, limbs that need to be removed, you know, having to deal with these things that take much longer to happen um, is harder to see without that data, but those numbers are there. I wonder if I could ask you, um, how do you talk with clients when you think about here's, you know, whether you're introducing them to Narcan um, or some other methods of harm reduction? Maybe, Noam, you could start with that. How do you, um, if you don't have, you know, how do you start that conversation with folks? Introduce them to different concepts or different strategies that they might use. 
Yeah, I mean, most of the time it's not us introducing them to Narcan. It's like, you know, injection drug users or, or people who use street drugs, typically they know already what Narcan is. And, um, you know, it's like everyone is the expert on their own body. Everyone is the expert on their own life. And I found that to be really true. You know, people understand that like using injection drugs is not healthy. You know, people know that, but they want to do, they want to make choices that are best for themselves. So we want to, you know, walk alongside them and not come from a place of like judgment, you know, just say no, drugs are bad, because we know statistically that doesn't work. Um, but when it comes to Narcan and using, you know, clean rigs and all that, basically, and Andrew, I mean, you can speak more to this too, but like people typically know how to use Narcan. They know if they want the nasal versus, you know, the vials or the auto injector. Um, they're always going to be on the cutting edge as far as harm reduction. Like people on the street are always going to be the experts on harm reduction because they're the ones, you know, living there and they are experts in the field, literally, because <laughs> they live there. Um, as far as like, I don't know that we've had to convince someone of the use of Narcan because most people have had to use it on a friend or loved one. Um, so they understand the importance of it um, or they've experienced an overdose and had, you know, come back because of Narcan. Um, yeah, I think people do want to make, you know, healthier choices, especially with their hygiene and stuff. And a lot of times it's just that the opportunity is not there or the access is not there. Um, so we just try to provide that access and, and take that barrier away. Yeah, I yeah think you mentioned earlier about them being experts. A lot of these folks we work with, they've saved way more people than we have. I mean, they they are with the folks who need Narcan. They, are, they need it every day sometimes. Um, so yeah, I mean that just that point alone I think is huge. Just a reminder to everyone who's watching, if you have questions for uh Noam and Andrew, uh feel free to put them into the comments and, and we'll get to them, we'll get to them shortly. I think you mentioned both of you mentioned this earlier about um meeting people where they're at um as, as being part of harm reduction. Um and can you say a little bit more about how that operates? in terms of um, how it jives with the, the Knight Ministry's values um, and how we approach people. I, I think I was uh, making that point to uh, effect two in twofold, um, partially in that motivational interviewing is a, is a tactic used to try and, and really hear people out um, and let people really be heard. Um, so we want to meet them where they're at as far as where they're, what stage of change they're in. Are they, are they really ready to make all the changes that we would like them to make or we would hope for them to be able to make? Who knows? That's, that's it's a different scenario with every person. And that person may change from day to day. Um, and then physically, we meet them physically where they are at. You know, they don't have to come looking for us a lot of the time. Uh, we, we pick up the phone every day. And, um, you know, we're, we're busy sometimes. It's, we don't get to hit everybody who calls that phone, but, you know, we do our best to, uh, to try and find people. Uh, we, you know, we've, a lot of folks we see regularly, we know where their spot is and it's not someplace you can see just driving past. Uh, you you got to know where to look. Um, but yeah, the, the essence of that is just knowing really and understanding where someone's at, where, what they're ready to do. Um, as far as uh, met, like the medication assisted treatment, there are options that can get people off drugs, off, off the, the street heroin or opiates, I should say, uh, 
within a couple of days. Um, but is that something that is going to be safe for them? Are they really ready to stick to that regimen? Uh, because if they're not, and we want to we want to account for that. That relapse is a scary thing uh, with these with these really strong opiates out there. And if if you are sober for just a day or two, that can throw your whole system off. It will throw your whole system off. And um, what was working for you two days ago is going to be different now. Your dosing is going to be different now. That that is what leads to overdose. That is uh, that is a really really dangerous game. And with the strength of that stuff out here right now, I mean the quantities are so small. So the difference between a really tiny bit and a really really tiny bit is not very much at all. So you we have to really take all of these things into account. Um, even if someone does want to do better, does want to make changes, um, we have to be really realistic with with what uh, implications come with that. Can I ask a quick follow-up about, can you explain a little bit, um, one of you, what motivational interviewing is? I, it's a, um, it's a, I guess I shouldn't say simple. It's a person-centered therapeutic uh, strategy, basically. Um, that allows uh, someone to feel heard. Uh, it's a it's a strategy that uses uses um, active listening um, to get someone to feel comfortable and to be able to talk in a way that isn't feeling judged. Um, and it is it's not uh, injecting my values into your treatment plan. It's not me telling you what I think is best for you. And this is what you should do next. Yeah, that's very powerful. Um, so everybody's been talking about COVID-19 and I just wanted to, to bring that in to this discussion. Um, what kinds of impact have you seen the pandemic have on, um, on, on the folks that you serve, particularly around um, behaviors that are targeted with harm reduction, um, or has it helped any in terms of um, maybe people looking to take more advantage of some opportunities, maybe to get clean or something like that? Could you speak to those? Um, well, I mean, first, we don't necessarily use the language of like getting clean. Mm -hmm. um, because we don't, we don't necessarily, we don't like to kind of divide like people who are using drugs as dirty versus not using drugs as clean. Um, I would say COVID has kind of cut off a lot of the services that people were relying on, especially, you know, in the loop when people used to just like sit along state or sit along Michigan and that's how they would get their income um there's not the same level of foot traffic i mean it's a little it's a little bit more normal now but when we were out you know really during the curfews and everything there's just it was there was no one there so that impacted people financially and then because of the risk of infection within closed spaces um the places that people relied on for basic hygiene a lot of those were not accessible so the, the nonprofits that provide, you know, free public showers or even like the daytime drop-in centers, a lot of those are not operating anymore. So people have less access to a clean bathroom, less access to a shower or laundry. Um, so that has been uh, a big issue with our clients as well. And at the same time, I mean, it, it did and I think Andrew can speak to this too, but it did spur a lot of people to want to start Suboxone, um, which is one of our medication assisted treatment uh, options. Um, so that was positive because it, it was their decision. They wanted to start Suboxone. So that was really nice to see. Um, but as far as, you know, city resources, it's been a little, sparse, I would say. So we yeah. did have a, oh, go ahead, Andrew, please. I, I would say that's the sort of a silver lining of COVID is that 
because we're not really we're, we're not encouraged to be face to face um having to use telehealth telemed whatever we're calling it um to do these appointments it makes it so much easier for our folks we still have to find them get our phone in their hands um but that just having it that step alone um really increases the odds for for them getting help uh, for them getting medication sometimes within the same day um, and that just wasn't an option before we didn't those those programs were not in place they may have been but not not popular you know it, it wasn't widespread um, so that is that's been huge for us can you explain a little bit about that program uh, and about what suboxone uh, helps with yeah, so Suboxone is an agonist antagonist, which is, it's uh, sort of works as an opiate and an opiate blocker at the same time. So this can help with cravings. This can help with sickness. Um, whereas, like say methadone, the classic opiate, uh, is just an opiate. It's just a replacement, so to speak. They're they're all kind of replacements, I guess, if you if you look at it that way. But um, it's a much safer option. Um, so if you do try to get high, you can get high on it, but it takes quite a bit more. Um, so the, the idea is that um, it takes the uh, withdrawal symptoms away, um, sort of staves them off in a way as well. Uh, I, I guess replacement isn't my favorite word for it, but in, in essence, it is a replacement. Uh, you still are taking a drug that is addictive. Um, you will need to lean off of the suboxone as well but um the the benefits it gives folks uh for diminishing cravings is huge because that is the phenomenon of craving uh, that is the phenomenon of addiction is the uh, the craving and to be able to address that piece um, along with all the other painful effects uh, that come with withdrawal um, is a big deal the difficult piece about that is that you cannot just go from taking heroin, taking an opiate, fentanyl in this case mostly, um, to directly using Suboxone. You have to go into some significant withdrawal symptoms, which is really difficult for folks. That is typically that is the main reason for continuing use uh, is to avoid those painful symptoms. Uh, so it does require sometimes up to 48 hours of, of withdrawal symptoms um, and with these really powerful opiates on the street that, that can be pretty painful on top of that doing that when you're not in a medical environment you're not in a detox program you are in a tent you are outside in the elements around who knows who um, fending for yourself the like I said mentioned earlier that piece of, of respecting the relapse and respecting the the harm that that could potentially put someone in is all part of the concern um, so we don't take any of this stuff lightly you know it's a great drug in a lot of ways um, but it's not a miracle it isn't uh, a cure-all it it can help a lot of things but th it must be um, it, it doctors have to pre prescribe these things for a reason and so we had a question from Bob about how do you do we literally give somebody a phone that they can use to make that appointment. Can you explain a little bit about the appointments that we're able to facilitate? Uh, yeah, we, we use the street medicine phone right now. Um, there is hopes that uh, one of the psychiatrists who we work with at uh, UIC, um, Miles Square is the hospital or the specific spot that helps us with the suboxone inductions. Um, so there's a doctor who is, uh, putting us in a grant to hopefully get them iPhones that they can hang on to, um, to make their own appointments and just, you know, and to just use to live because it's pretty hard to live without a phone these days. Um, but typically we have to find them and, and let them use our phone. Right. And Noam, I have a question for you from, from Bob. Um, Bob writes, I understand the logic of not using the term clean. Um, and is wondering, I think you touched on this, but are there other alternative ways to 
alternative language or other ways that, that, that we talk about the journey from one place to another. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's such an interesting question because some people really connect with that language of like wanting to get clean or, and some people really don't. I, I try to just follow people's lead. Um, it's kind of similar to the way that we don't necessarily say like, oh, we work with homeless people. You know, technically speaking, that is true, but that's not the language that's normally used um, as far as like within nonprofit circles. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you go, you know, if you go talk to a client and say like, okay, how would you describe your housing situation? Most likely they would self describe themselves. Oh, that was really clunky, but you know what I mean? Um, they would say, you know, I'm homeless. So even if we wouldn't necessarily put that, you know, if, we have to follow the lead of our clients as far as how they would identify themselves. So if they're saying to us like, okay, I want to get clean. I want to get sober. Then we follow their lead on that with the language. But if they're saying, I don't want to stop using drugs. I have no interest in not in, you know, using less drugs. What I care about is my housing or my ID or my, you know, Medicaid card or whatever they, their priority is. So then we follow their lead on that too. Um, I guess, yeah, my policy would just be, you know, some, it, it would just depend on how that individual connects with the language around it. Um, and, you know, if they're in like an NA or AA group, that could be totally different too. So I don't know if that really answers the yes, question. Yes, I think I think it I think it does. I think that's a the, that's a, the great harm answer. Harm reduction just simply doesn't um, focus on sobriety. That as a as a core fundamental piece of harm reduction, it's it's not a focus on sobriety. So just I think the word clean is uh, has the connotation that there are no drugs. There are zero drugs, zero alcohol, and um, that's not white the focus for us. That's a that's a very important point. I wonder if we could talk just a little bit. I know both of you work in street medicine, um, but at the Night Ministry, we also have our youth housing programs. A little bit about what harm reduction might look like um, in, in those settings. Who wants to feel that one? I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to keep the volume <laughs> oh, so the question was, uh, sorry about that. The question was, I, obviously, both of you, you know, work in street medicine, but at the Night Ministry, we also have our youth housing programs. And so maybe if we could touch a little bit on what harm reduction might look like uh, in the housing programs. Yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned, uh, the Night Ministry sees housing as the number one uh, preventer for most of like harmful effects of living on the street. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can get, if you can get to youth before they've been, you know, putting X amount of years on the streets, uh, you're just inherently going to avoid extra problems. Um, also, I mean, I don't, I, practicing street medicine, I guess we could say, um, harm reduction is, is a difficult lens. So practicing uh, mental health treatment on the street, uh, we, we have to kind of uh, have a different definition of what success looks like for a lot of clients. These are, these are incremental changes that we try to make. Like I said, harm reduction is based in their view or what they can do. And using motivational interviewing is based in meeting them where they are at. So if we want them to get a house, we can find them housing at some points and still not get them housed because their lifestyle is so erratic that it's difficult to just pick up your life and then go in the, you know, in the, into four walls where you don't have your community around you, where you're not attached to the street like you, you have been for so long. So these things are 
uh, they they kind of this this lifestyle kind of sinks its its teeth into you in a way, and um, to see the younger ones have a safe place to go to start, I guess, craving uh, those the, the the structure of that. I mean, I think that's huge. We have a question from from Lisa, who, who I think it in some ways relates to what you were just saying. What programs are are, are available to help clients? Um, in Lisa's words, when they're out of harm's way and want to avoid future harm. So I think Andrew, you were talking about someone um, who does get housing, but they're you know that's just picking up and moving. For example, there are some complications with that. How are we able to support people if we're able to get them into housing, for example, what do we do to offer them or what can we help them with to help them maintain that housing? Yeah, I think that's such a good question because uh, like Andrew said, it's a it's completely a lifestyle change. So typically when we get our clients housed, um, well, it's a little different now because of COVID, like everything. But typically we would help them move their belongings into their unit because um, they might have some heavy belongings that they can't carry. And, you know, we would our, we have our case manager who would help to get basic household items like pots and pans, you know, furniture, if we can get furniture for them, plates, you know, cups, just basic stuff that you wouldn't even necessarily think about, but if you've been living on the street for a long time, you probably don't have, you know, pots and pans sitting around. Um, and then as far as providing support, we also have a peer support advocate on the team. And so he helps our clients to locate uh, food pantries, you know, events at the library, um, different AA or NA meetings, if they're interested in that, um, different community supports, you know, if they're interested in church services, he'll help them and just kind of follow their lead on what resources they're looking for so that they don't feel isolated once they're within housing. Um, like Andrew said, you know, if you're coming from an encampment with 10 people who you've been living in that encampment for however many years, and then suddenly you're on your own in housing, you might feel a little bit isolated. So we try to just kind of step in and provide some support around that. Can you all share any stories about um, how engaging a client around harm reduction has led them to a healthier place? I mean, we see we see that with uh, pretty pretty quickly with uh, the suboxone. I mean, just just in that they're not they're not under under the influence. It, that that's a big thing. I mean, to be to be of your wits in uh, in these like riskier environments that can be sort of dangerous um, is one thing. But then to see them start to um, just kind of be just thinking more, just using their mind and talking more and talking more about what they'd like to do next, and to start seeing that you know building that steam on that grain of salt like. You really, you really start to see that change and uh, start to see those wheels turning. Um, I mean, that's that's the stuff I focus on um, because, like I said, that's my focus typically. But I mean, no, and could probably speak to this, but uh, we have other people who work with us who who get folks housed, and just get, having sent pictures of. Oh, this is this folk person we've been working with for X amount of years, and um, they're walking into their house for the first time. I mean, that's a pretty big. I, I don't even really know how to put that into words. I mean, getting sober is is a feat. Uh, getting a house after living on the uh, streets for 30 years. I mean, it's it's like. It, there's no words for it. Maybe maybe no one has words for it. I really can't. It's it's difficult to to put into words uh, how much that means to somebody. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I a hundred percent agree. I think, you know, one story I can think of is we moved um, this older gentleman into an apartment and he had been sleeping outside for about 25 years. So, you know, that was a huge change for him and we were able to bring his belong. This was before COVID, but we were able to bring him and his belongings, you know, to his new apartment and provide him with household items and, you know, community resources. And it was just surreal knowing that he had been living outside for so long. And then now he has permanent supportive housing. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's hard to describe, but it, it makes all the rainy days and driving through snow and all that stuff. It's totally worth it. So, yeah. All right. I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, I wanted to again thank uh, Noam Green and Andrew Whitehoff for joining us today to talk about this important subject. And thank you to everyone uh, who also joined us. Um, just a quick plug. Uh, we're holding a special community celebration of Thanksgiving virtually on Tuesday, November 17th at 5.30 p.m. You can go to our website, uh, thenightministry.org slash events, or look for the event if you're on Facebook and you can find out more about that event. Um, again, thank you, Noam and Andrew. Really appreciate you sharing your experience and your insight with us today. Thanks, Bert. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please, everyone, uh, be safe and be well. Take care.